Here we are once again, the tag team champions of comic book YouTubers. It's like Professor Griff said, man, the revolution will not be televised. It'll be streamed on this YouTube channel. My name is Ed Piscor. My name is Jim Rogg. Jim, what weekend is it? April 14th? I'll take your word for it, man. <laughs> I think I might be off on that date. <laughs> feels like, it feels like it's been a month since I've seen you, man. I agree, and I don't understand what that's about. I it's, guess it's just busy, lots of stuff, running in a lot of different directions, crossing off lots of stuff from the to-do list. It is funny how sometimes it feels like weeks have passed. It's been seven days since we've last recorded, and uh, it is astonishing the amount of stuff that you could get done in that seven-day period when the focus is not just a single page of comics per day or something like that. That's, I think that's the thing that makes it feel like a lot has happened because you're, you are like switching mindsets. You're, you're doing a lot of different tasks. Uh, yeah, it definitely has been a full week. I don't know that I have taken a complete day off since I finished drawing X-Men, but I was kind of shocked to realize as I was kind of just going through my motions, operating at my default setting, and I realized I'm working on three books at once now. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm putting together the trade paperback for the last X-Men book. What I'm doing is they gave me my deadlines. It's about a two-month deadline, which is plenty of time to do it at my leisure, basically. And what I'm doing is every day coloring a new page of comics. That will be the added bonus material to uh, the back of the book in the same way as, um, you know, I colored Kirby's X-Men number one in the first book, colored Giant Size X-Men two, oh, what, Giant Size X-Men for the second book, and we haven't yet announced the, uh, the third comic that I'm doing, Ben, but boy, it's fun looking at that thing at a molecular level. So I'm also, uh, I did about five pages of roughs on my new thing, and that's a really fun position to be in because I'm developing this world. There's no preconceived notions of like what this comic should be from anybody. So every decision you make, you're solidifying it more and more into being a, what it is. And it's, uh, it is a fun thought exercise. Very exhausting though, because like the gears are constantly grinding the whole time. We could get into that kind of shit a little bit later, but the other thing that I'm working on is I spent the weekend doing annotations for the uh, Studio Edition book, the Ed Piscor Studio Edition book from Fanta. That's going to pay off. I, I, I look forward to those big time. I, got, I have to thank uh, Eric Reynolds and Jacob Covey, I almost called him Covey, <laughs> for, <laughs> for helping me like fashion this thing because they are doing a lot of the back-end work. And man, working with an independent publisher, one of the real benefits of doing this is the fact that that Eric Reynolds is co-publisher of Fantagraphics. He has skin in the game. So he has every vested interest in seeing that this thing turns out great. And every day there's a new PDF being generated where, you know, I scanned a bunch of material and just kind of like we laid it out all out on the table. And every day, man, we're making decisions and like reshuffling things. And the PDF is getting smaller and smaller and smaller into becoming like what it's going to be, man. And it's very exciting to watch, especially to work with Two very smart guys that I have nothing but absolute respect for. This is a step, this is editing. You know, whether it's, it's film editing, comics editing, writing editing, all this stuff is editing. And I think, like, it's such an underrated part of the process, and I love it. And it's book design, which both of those guys, you know, that's their life. Yeah. Uh, so pretty good partners to work on a book with. But that step is so great where you have your mound of papers, you sort of have this rough shape and you turn it into this finely honed piece. Yeah. And working with those guys, man, that's an all-star team. Um, you know, I'm putting together Street Angel this, this, I don't know when it's actually due, I'm pretty far ahead schedule-wise, but that's a lot of what I did last week was put together a lot of pages for that. And it's a similar process where it's like I have books of material and it's going through and tweaking things, resizing things, trying to figure out the order of these things, how they all fit together. What book I it, like what, that. What book is this that you're putting together? It's Street Angel, Deadliest Girl Alive. It'll be out in October. Uh, Pre-orders are already open on Amazon, so it's it's beginning through that process. And I, I don't know the deadline. Like I said, it's probably a couple months before it comes out. Um, Image turns around books pretty quickly, so they haven't given me the deadline yeah. yet. But I'm just ahead of schedule because it's putting that book together. You know, it's, it's similar to what you're doing uh, on, a, on a different scale, 
but it's a step I really like. I like these finishing steps where you get to see the final piece emerge. Yeah. And I find that really exciting. But that editing process where it's like you have all of this and when you include one piece, it means getting rid of something else that might be similar. You know, like it's often making that choice of like, I've got a couple that I want to represent this one page, which one wins? And it, it affects everything. It's like, it's dominoes, you know, it's all connected, especially, you know, that's what a book is, is like, how does it all fit together? The annotations, I think, is brilliant. You know, like, we've talked lots about artist editions. They're some of my favorite thing that exists on earth, in comics, in art. Amazing new format that emerged in the past 10 years. But I think that there's still room to uh, really explore that format. And I've seen some of what you are doing, and I think it's it's I think it will advance artist editions. And I'm excited for that, man. I, I think it really is going to take the artist edition concept to another level. That's nice of you to say. We'll see how it shakes out. <laughs> we have to send this baby off within the next three weeks because the difference between Fanta and Image when it comes to, to printing is we go to China for that stuff. And there are only two ways to get things back from China. Either a very expensive airplane trip right. or a very slow boat across the Pacific Ocean. Right. <laughs> I have a question. Yeah. Have you looked at other books for examples of annotations? And I'm thinking of things like From Hell, you know, Alan Moore annotated that thing to death in an amazing way. Chester Brown has often included indexes and notes, uh, very detailed notes in the backs of some of his collections. Yeah. And then monographs, you know, a lot of artist monographs will have notes by the artist or by the author sort of detailing why are we looking at this piece or what makes this piece significant or where does it fit in the context. So are you thinking in those terms when you're putting together annotations? Because, I mean, like, it's a pretty wide range of material that you're calling from. Yeah, little bits. Um, I'm looking at all that stuff. I'm looking at all the Abrams monographs. And I'm trying to imagine, like, what works and what doesn't. Um, one of the big sort of weaknesses of the Dan Klaus uh, monograph, to my taste, was that we just didn't get to see enough art, uh, enough original art. Um, and that always kind of stuck in my mind because I was waiting for that thing. So the art is the thing. Like it's still basically an artist edition right. and when, when it's all said and done. Now here's the difference between my studio edition and most other ones because they're all geared, generally speaking, to, to a comic book audience, uh, an audience who, who has a vocabulary in comics and, and they know the material specifically. My audience really is like comic people and then there's this extra group of like hip hop people that I brought in. So that's the mindset I'm thinking about with the annotations where I'm merging the two, man. I'm talking art on some of them. I'm talking about like hip hop significance on other parts of the thing too, man. And trying to just marry it all up, man. There's gonna be X-Men pages in there. We're showing off the public enemy toy designs. That's the big challenge right now is figuring out how to show that stuff off. Because with the, with the Klaus monograph, like I said, man, you, there's all this varying exhibition of, of the artwork. And I think we're gonna have to break format for the public enemy figures because I want, it doesn't need to be 20 pages to show that off. So it's like, maybe we don't see the art at 100%. Maybe that's right. not required. So what you do is you do both versions and then, you, and then you see what works. That's exactly what you do. That's, that's always the answer for this kind of stuff. Whenever you're thinking like, you know, how should this be treated? It's visual, like make both, mock up both. You can then, you know, there's no guessing. There's no, uh, I'm imagining something differently than what's in your head. Like make it and look at it. Everything that we were just talking about, like the editing stage, for a new cartoonist, this is kind of everything because when you're getting started and you're putting to get together your first stuff, you are so eager to see this thing in print, but if you just relax and be objective and give your work another pass, you know what I mean, and, and be hard on yourself, you will end up with a much uh, better product. In some way, I hesitate to say that because I don't want you to get caught up in that endless loop of refining to the point where well, yeah, where nothing comes out. But I guess what I'm saying is patience. Like the thing that I've learned the most like, over the past like decade is to just kind of like have some patience. When I started uh, working in comics and I would be say three quarters of the way through with my first say five jobs, I had this like existential feeling where it's like, I hope I don't die in a car wreck or something and, <laughs> and I don't get to see my thing in print. Like that, that was literally like a thought that would be in my mind. But do you, want a, do you want a book to come out that looks shitty? Like, I'd rather be dead. Yeah, I, it, it's also hard, I think, for young cartoonists because you have a million reps drawing. Yeah. But 
if you haven't completed anything yet, you have zero reps of like the editing stage, the putting together part, the maybe taking time to rest and then revisit it in yeah. a week with fresh eyes. Those are all brand new territory. And like you say, you're eager to get the thing out. Um, you know, and, and it's harder to get reps on that side because you get those reps by making a book. Yeah. So it's an important step, uh, but it's not one that's easy to simulate. You know, you sort of just have to make the books and, and be cognizant of these pieces and, and possibly, you know, read about editing and read about how guys put this stuff together. I remember reading Dan Cloud's interviews and he would talk about having his his list of edits or whatever. And it's that extra 5% at the end. You know, it's, yeah. you may be sick of this material. You've been working on it for who knows how long. But if you just power through that last two weeks of like make fixing those things that you have notes on, it'll end up, you know, paying huge dividends. That extra couple percent at the end is often what separates the good cartoonist from the great cartoonist. You know, it's everybody gets a certain distance, but only a few actually take do that extra effort at the end, uh, which is part of this. Seems to work in every medium, too, because I was going through all those master classes and Aaron Sorkin would mention... Uh, in his in his uh, screenwriting, I guess, or writing for drama masterclass, that to hedge against laziness, he would also redraft the entire script a second time to just make sure that he gets in uh, the things that he meant to get in there, and also to be forced to revisit certain moments that, like, oh, maybe this really isn't working for me, and it needs to be rethought. But speaking about uh, making books, I see that you bought some books, man. Where the heck did you get this Fireball <laughs> book, man? I would kill to have this thing. The, the envy of the internet right here, right? This is, uh, this is a Jamie Hewlett collection. Yeah, where'd you buy that thing? From Deadline Magazine and one of my favorite strips of his. That is handmade. Yeah, who made it for you? I made it for me. How? That's one of my fun activities this week, my, my leisure time in, in the evenings. Um, same way you make any book. It started with the stack of deadlines. So I collected all the deadlines that have these stories in it. It's probably 10 or 12 issues. I scanned all of it. Uh, then I made prints of it. And then I made the book. So like it's, it's kettle stitched. You know, I think we're going to do a show and tell and get into some of the process. And I recorded a lot of the process. We're going to have to get into a show and tell about this, man. But, you know, I've talked about, I like making things and I like making books. And so, you know, I've seen people make hardcover books. It's not uncommon that collectors will take uh, comic books and have them bound, have somebody else bind them. Um, but I see, you know, it's the internet, like you can find tutorials on anything. So like I see stuff about how to make books. I've been wanting to do it for a while. I've been thinking about doing it for a while. And, and you know, my schedule opened up. I had some evenings free. So I actually made three books this week. You're the Bob Vila of comics, man. What are the other ones that you made? The other ones are Street Angel. You know, it's a it's a mock-up. I'm putting together the Street Angel collection. So this is all of my mini comics that I made. And I like this one because it has some, like, different, you know, black and white. And uh, all these different versions that I made. Risograph. I think that's just kind of cool to see all bound together in a book. So that's one I've been thinking about doing for a while. And now that I'm putting together the Street Angel book, it's sort of perfect to have a reference for it. And then the third one, uh, Slash Maraud. This is a Paul Galassi, Doug Mensch DC comic from the late 80s that I like a lot. It's never been collected as far as I know. So this was the classic just binding some comic books together. Slippery Slope. Uh, into, into this. Yeah. Slippery slope. I can imagine uh, I can imagine seeing a big giant library like like the, the Maesters in Game of Thrones at your crib in the future. I enjoyed doing it. I don't know how much more I'm going to bind in the near future. Uh, I, I do think about comics that would make good collections. One of them that we've talked about is a collection of Pit from Image. You know, it's 20 issues. It would be a nice, nice big hardcover. So we'll see. But uh, for now, this is this is it for now. But it's it was uh, this was my arts and crafts for this week. Amazing, man. We're going to have to do a show and tell uh, about this for sure, because I just have no idea where that where the heck to begin. Speaking of show and tells, man, we uh, put out the uh, the Captain Marvel uh, show and tell this past week, man, where we pulled out the old Carl Burgos. We pulled the swerve, man. <laughs> And we showed off the old Carl Burgos, like, ridiculous uh, Captain Marvel. You know, you should see it, absolutely. It's about 10 minutes. But we actually didn't do it justice in the way that I would have if I would have given it a second pass. Just by looking at the covers, it's far more, not sinister, but he's far more, let's say, butthurt about, yes. about his situation. Because there on the cover, there are characters called Dr. Fate... <laughs> Adam, you open up one of the comics, Captain Marvel is fighting Destroyer, who is another timely Marvel comic. Uh, Dr. Fate, if 
Stan Lee look like the Stan Lee that we know and love him to be in like the 70s, in the early 70s or late 60s, whenever that came out? Dr. Fate has the brown hair on the top and, and the white on the sides. Like, it's, it's Stan Lee. Yeah, for sure. You know, we probably dropped the ball on talking about Dan Klaus is a big fan of those Captain Marvels. You know, they have that w very weird sensibility that yeah. a lot of the 60s superheroes do, especially the ones that kind of fade into obscurity and only exist for a few issues. You know, they're just weird. There's also uh, one of the issue covers has a Reed Richards looking guy yeah. stretching and everything. Like it's it's impossible not to see the Fantastic it's, Four on that cover. It's a comic called The Terrible Five. <laughs> I think we, we, we did cover that bit. It's true, we, it's we, true. We, we were smart in that end, but the Akira episode came out, man, on Monday, volume one. Yes. Probably our most successful uh, episode out of the gate so far. I feel like that tells me a lot about like what the kayfabers want to see in a certain way, man. They want to they want us to hit they want us to hit some some uh, some of these big comics, man. I'm so excited to have that out. You know, we, we've been working on Otomo episodes, and a couple of those had come out. It takes a while to edit these, so like yeah. we record them far in advance of their release. And I felt so good about the Akira episode, so it's great to have it out and to be getting the positive response we're getting. Uh, because I do want to do more of that. You yeah. know, we finish recording those, and I know we stand around and sort of talk about what else can we, what other books can we do. You know, it's kind of this book club with with everything we know about comics and how, you know, how to contextualize this stuff. And man, there's a lot of comics that I'm excited to get into that with. It's one of those things I loved when I found comic book stores and started to find some friends who were into comics was that, a, that let's get together and talk about this comic I love. Yeah. And let me hear, you know, your version of what you're seeing. And that kind of has fallen away. You know, the internet's created everything as sort of niche. So whatever you're into you just go off in your corner and be into it. And I don't get that same experience now as often of like, hey, we all read the same thing. Let's discuss it. Um, so it's awesome that the response has been good because I definitely want to do more of those. And my list of comics I want to talk about is, is growing. So uh, in celebration of the Akira episode, we made a new shirt, uh, Read More Manga. It's available on our spread shop. Um, very excited to have it. I, I love making these shirts. Yeah. This is one that I that I'm pretty pleased with. It's it's an homage to the Akira movie poster uh, treatment. So uh, read more comics. I think the Japanese. It's in a different order. If you were actually speaking this, shouts to uh, Japanese rapper Pun P who laid it all out for us. This is how we would say it. This is how you would say it using like the American, you know, the English kind of like syntax. And uh, we, he gave us options. Yeah, so I'm pretty excited for it, and I'm excited to see what people are doing with it. You know, on Spreadshop, if you haven't been there, there are a lot of options for what you want to print onto, what color you want to print with. We have a dark design and a light design. I just saw somebody made a maroon sweatshirt with the white letters, white and red letters, and it looks really good. Yeah. So uh, pretty cool to see that floating around the world and... Uh, you know, just more celebration of the Akira episode as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, we have to thank you guys for uh, supporting the channel that way, man. We are on the road to 6,000 subscribers at this point, man. We got about, we're about 20% of the way there, man. So old subscribers and new, much appreciated. Welcome to the channel if you're new to the game, man. In preparation for my new book, I'm playing around with some new methods and materials ahead of time because I'm going to be spending probably a few months like laying this thing mm -hmm. out and it's going to give me a lot of uh, free drawing time essentially man to just daydream so I'm trying to come up with some new techniques and I've done something you know I've been buying supplies and I've done something that I said I was never going to do again but it's sort of necessary and I feel naked without these materials man but I bought um I bought probably the third set in my life of um, Rapidograph pens, man, because those fuckers clog. Read any tutorials you want. Uh, handle them with so any sort of kid gloves. They somehow still figure out a way to either get clogged or get something in there that when you're cleaning them out, you create the opposite of a vacuum. I guess you put air pressure in it, and then when you put ink in there, it just drips out of the damn tip. So I got this like humidifier key, round, ruler case. Are you familiar with this thing? I, I no, I heard you mention it, but I, I don't know that I don't have one of those. Yeah, yeah. So it's like it's this case, and you put water in the bottom, and you put your pens in there, and they sort of promise that it won't dry out. Like your your pen tips will never dry out, man. Feels specious, feels dubious, but I need these precise thicker line widths that other fine liners just will not give me and the price of like two or three rapidographs is the price of 
the whole set of seven. Right. Yeah. That's always the, the gimmick. Yeah. yeah. So just get all seven, you know, and, and like, I think I, of all the sets that I have, I still haven't used like the smallest one. So I have like triplicate of that now. I can't imagine using that smallest one. I have a set of rapidographs too, and it's same deal. It's sort of mostly in the middle range, uh, maybe the heaviest one. There's a, there's a heavier one that doesn't come in the set. I think it's pink. Mm. It's just absurd. The orange one is all you need. Yeah, it really is. So, yeah, I, I end up using about half the set, you know, maybe every other one until you get way into the smallest ones, and then it's, it's too much. Like, I don't know how you would keep that thing clean and open. I clean mine regularly uh, because I don't use them that often. It's, it's become a tool that is sort of phased out more and more. Um, but I, I have cleaned them where like I stripped them all the way down to even having that wire pulled out from the oh, barrel. Wow. Yeah. It, it's, it's kind of neat. Uh, so I've had okay luck with them, but if you don't use them regularly, they do, as you say, they dry up, the ink dries up, it clogs. They're a, they're a finicky tool. I'm, I'm uh, imagining you as like a young John Osterman, Dr. Manhattan, like with your little watchmaker <laughs> gimmicks, man, with like little gears all over, like on a little rag. It, that's exactly right. That is exactly, <laughs> <laughs> that is exactly right. What are you going to do though, you know? Yeah, listen, man, uh, in my lifetime since I've been buying those things, I see how inflation works, man, because those things were $60 when, when I was a teenager, when I got my first set, 100 bucks now. Yeah. Yeah, I think the demand goes down. Yeah. Or, or the production maybe goes down because the demand is down and then, you know, the prices go up or something. But it's an expensive tool. It's, it's, uh, that's an old school tool. Feel naked without it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, to break kayfabe on our little monitor here, it's sort of attached to my telephone as well. And I just see that I, I get my important mail sent to uh, my folks' crib and I just got a text that said, you got a big box here, man. So that's where I'll be heading uh, right after we finish our shoots. It's so much fun getting like a box of art supplies. Yeah. That's always, that's always fun. I, I end up ordering half the art supplies I get. I end up ordering. It's just easier, more convenient. There's no art store near me. So it's always, uh, it's a good day whenever that box shows up. The big exercise for me is because I'm, it's going to be a darker story that I'm telling. And uh, I'm very interested in working at sort of the scale that you were working at. The idea of being able to get two pages done a day is very fucking attractive to me, man. So I'm going to try that. But in order for me to do that, I just had to change a lot of my tools because a lot of my inking supplies are just, they lay thicker lines down. And it would be too thick of a line for printing at that smaller size. You know what I mean? The big line is lends well to lots of uh, reduction and this won't be reduced that much so it's like i have boxes of fine liners that uh are of like a smaller width mm -hmm. read a bunch of comics this week oh what'd you read about a thousand pages of stuff preparing for akira volume two uh, which we're going to shoot probably on sunday after after this recording after this goes now up. i'm worried because i read akira volume two this week also but it's not a thousand pages so well, i may well, be behind and uh... well, I re well i read some other things too man i re i read um Alamore's run of uh, Miracle Man. I read it once before because uh, I, I have many of the issues, I, and I read those. But like those last couple in the teens, man, they're like I think I just need fifteen to be honest. Um, but reading it all together, it's the second time I've done that, and it's not. It's very imperfect the way the storytelling is done. Um, I remember being very confused about caption layouts on that story. Do I read? Because there will be a lot of these um, vertical panels, captions, and two-page spreads. Captions that go this way, captions that go this way. So do I read it like this per page? Do I read it across and then read the bottom? The answer is no, neither of those. You read this one, you read this one. And I'm saying at the polar opposite ends of the page, you read this, you read this. Right. You read this, you read this doesn't work that way no you tend to read there, there's a lot written on lettering and, and you tend to read like the next closest piece of lettering regardless of panel layouts yeah uh, especially yeah that's something to keep conscious of i have this theory lately that you know you should be able to read a comic without the words i think you should be able to read the comic without the art i think you should be able to read the comic at least the order of the balloons with nothing but the balloon placement um it, it's it's its own thing but uh I'm a little bit surprised by that, and I wonder about it. I talked to Steve Bissett about Swamp Thing at one point, and I think the lettering, and that's really strong. And he said that he would indicate the lettering in his pencils. So 
I wonder, you know, with with Miracle Man, I guess Toddleben doesn't come on until, I don't know, issue 10 or 12. You know, thinking of him working on Swamp Thing and if that would be something where he was indicating... Some of his spreads were bad. Yeah, some of some of his <clears throat> spreads, uh, spreads were, were uh, kind of bad when it came to that sort of thing, too. But certainly earlier, it was, it was uh, v- pretty much awful in spots where I would like, oh, no, I... I was supposed to read that instead of this. But there would be also really interesting, elegant ways when you talk about like read the next balloon closest or whatever, where there would be snake like mm-hmm. uh panel like caption composition that, that totally worked well, man. If you think about it, it's um it's an early Alan Moore work. It was for Warrior Magazine, the the earliest bits, and the editor for that, Des Skin, he described that Warrior Magazine, for all intents and purposes, was a fanzine. Um, so there was no major editorial like fist over top of these guys. There's something to say for the Kirby, Ditko, Jim Shooter kind of panel layout, man. Tell the fucking story. Don't get cute uh, or else you're going to create confusion. And the reason I'm even talking about it is because I could easily see that turning a reader off. Um, it, like somebody new to comics right. or something like that, I could easily see that turning somebody off because it was confusing me and frustrating me, and it was remi- it was like triggering my mind to like the young little Eddie who's like, this is impossible. Like this is for adults. Like why am I so stupid? <laughs> right. And and with like you know a couple thousand pages under my belt, you know 15, 20 years of professional experience in the game, I could say like your masters, man, are not flawless. I think that's true. I think that's true of, of everything. Yeah. You know, I don't believe in much, but I do <laughs> believe like nobody's perfect, nothing's perfect. And you know, I, I get frustrated because I have friends who that's all they dwell on are the imperfections. And it's it's frustrating to me because it's like that's everything. Like you can yeah. always find that part. Whereas with something like Miracle Man, it's like with that said that there are flaws, there are also some amazing ideas and executions of some of those ideas, you know, artistically. So I think, you know, if you're if you're waiting for that perfect thing, it's just like perfectionism and making stuff. Yeah. Like, you're going to kill yourself the reason you know, miserably. The reason I'm even bringing it up uh, to, to clarify is because it is kind of a masterpiece in a way. Yeah. But just to reinforce that masterpieces are not flawless. That Like, that's the reason I bring it up. I'm not, like, hooping and hollering about, like, something that stinks. It's just, like, it's uh, refreshing to me to read something really fucking good and to see that, like... It wasn't all figured out, man. Like, like I n- sort of appreciate that. I sort of need that. Um, even doing our Akira episodes is kind of a little bit of that for me, where it's like, this is like something that is heralded. We might not necessarily have to talk about that all the time, like when we do the coverage, but to notice like, oh, Tomo kind of fucked up here. He's a human being. A lot of serial storytelling is that way. Yeah. You know, TV shows, uh, certainly comic books. And Miracle Man, especially because like that starts out as these little serialized chunks, yeah. and then at some point it's it's brought to America, and now it's becoming comic book issues, and probably Alan Moore's idea of it changes. I've been um, I'm working on a zine and going through a lot of material from the '80s, the mid '80s, 1986 era. Yeah. And uh, Amazing Heroes, there are several news items in a row where it's like Miracle Man switching artists. Yeah. You know, so like there are a lot of moving parts there. You know, it's easy to understand. And with the Kira and some of the manga stuff that I've read. I get that sense of like, in the beginning you show up and you have some ideas, but ultimately you almost have to make a few chapters, get them in front of people, see how they respond. Um, You know, I think sitcoms do this a lot, you know, and everybody's a completist and wants to go back and start (laughs) at the beginning. And unfortunately, a lot of times that's not where characters are, what they will ultimately, you know, what they will become when we love them or they become iconic. They're not always there in the beginning. You know, it may be something that is developed. First season of Family Matters, man. There was no Steve Urkel. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Wrestling's a good one for this, too. You know, like, you see wrestlers co- often show up in some iteration. The Rock, you know, yeah. The Rock starts out com- very different than what The Rock becomes. And, you know, wrestlers will take off. In the old days, they would switch territories or whatever to, to keep refining that gimmick or maybe change the gimmick altogether once they're a little better in some other aspect or have a better idea to go with. So... I think that's pretty common, you know, but as completists, we want to go back and see this thing in its finished, polished state. Sometimes those early chapters, you see you see the seams. No, it's true. Speaking of response, we got a lot of snail mail, man. Wheelbarrows full of snail mail. We're keeping the post office in service. It's for sure, man. They know me there now. <laughs> <laughs> P.O. Box 3071, Munhall, Pennsylvania, 
15120 is the address. Cartoonist Kayfabe at the top. But I figure why not uh, take a minute to show off a couple of the highlight items that we got uh, this past week. We received a ton of stuff. There's a giant to read pile. There's so much stuff that we have to go through, man. Do not be insulted if we don't get to your work like right this minute, man. But uh, you want to start it off? I am going to start with this original art from Tony McMillan. Hey, man, I'm going to show off mine too then. Tony McMillan, not only did he send us some cool pieces of original art, including a piece of American uh, barbarian art for our uh, homeboy Tom Shioli, but the guy writes books, novels, and augmented fourth. And he did this four-issue uh, series so far called Lumen that has really incredible artwork. Not, not far from this kind of style. Heavy blacks that have, like, uh, white cut into them. Gestural drawing. Really, really cool stuff, man. Like, this is, go this is going pretty high at the top of uh, my two-read pile. Going to look for a good spread. It's a dark story, so it's kind of hard to see from, from, from this distance, man. But pretty good-looking stuff. Probably... Uh Influenced a bit by Copra, Michel Fife's Copra. Uh, might put you a little bit in mind of his style, but uh, fun fun to see a color work where somebody's doing everything himself, lettering on the page. Looks good. This is uh, Falling Up, and it's a collection of artwork and comics by Jake Galm. And part of it, it comes in this bag with some stickers and with this really cool name tag. I don't know, I'm getting some glare there, but it was pretty fun because he had these uh, addressed to each of us individually. Yeah. I like the whole package deal, and uh, and I like his art quite a bit. It's it's very attractive. It's um, mostly full, full page, full color, and I really like the coloring and the drawing, and some of the drawings are extremely inventive. You know, clearly comics-influenced style. Uh, pretty good to look at. Kind of a street artist flavor. Late Night at Kinko's by Will Pfeiffer. This was a really cool book to flip through. I haven't read it yet. I just, just got it today, but it's like mini comics and small press and just very uh, right up my alley, Super. let's say. You know, it's, it's, it's stuff that I'm sure nobody else is going to come up with. It seems personal. It seems unique and very attractive. Yeah, it's rigorous, man. There's a lot of stuff there on the page, man. Like this guy, it's no ham and egger, man. Dude put in some work. There's 200 pages of comics in that guy's yeah. book. Yeah, and any reference to Kinko's and photocopies and, and uh, you know, the, the days of old in a lot of ways for self-publishing speaks to me. <laughs> and those were the gimmicks that were sent to us where we each get a copy. Yeah, then there were a couple of things that were sent, I think, to, to break up the team, maybe. <laughs> it caused some strife. We're going to be... Uh, now, Cartoonist Kayfabe is a totalitarian regime <laughs> run by fucking Jim and Ed. But in order for us, you know, visiting kings to be able to get along with one another, we do have a little bit of democracy. And what's more democratic than just flipping a coin for some shit, man? So what do we got here? Some Buster Moody. Buster Moody. So I follow him online. Really good artist. He does a lot of, you know, pop culture, comic book inspired kind of work, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, things like that. So this is his new book, Laser Storm. And this is his previous book, The Full Color uh, task Force Rad Squad, but he sent one of each. Yeah. So, I guess... Uh, should, should we flip for the package? Here we go. All right, Winner man. Winner takes all. All right, man. Heads or tails, Jim? Heads. Tails. Oh, <laughs> come on, Buster. Listen, man. You're putting a lot of stress on us here, buddy. It's just like uh, it's just like Red's bike in that movie Friday. It'll be both of ours. We'll just keep it at my house. <laughs> one more to fight for. <laughs> People are phony. This is like an underground magazine size comic. Pretty interesting inside. It's, it's by uh, contributor Robert N. Posts a lot of comments, follows us. But again, there's only one of these, Ed. Do you want to call it or should I? You can call this one. All right, I'm going to say Tails again. Tails. <laughs> I'm going to need to see this coin. It feels <laughs> like right? something's just not right. <laughs> so you can also reach us via email, cartoonist.kfabe at gmail.com. We got a couple of emails this week. Uh, the first one from Adam Bazzi. I was wondering if you guys could go over the publishing process with different independent publishers. I can't find what's the difference between having your book published by Fanographics or Image or Dark Horse. The differences are, I, you know, I don't have a lot of experience working with every publisher. So, you know, the differences, they, they certainly vary from publisher to publisher. Usually you can find those differences in contracts. And hopefully your lawyer or agent is somebody you can talk to about adjusting those contracts to get what you want, to get what's important. Ed, you may be able to speak to this about some of the considerations you had when you were looking for the right publisher for Hip Hop Family Tree. I remember 
you know, there were things you wanted in that, mm -hmm. in that, in those books in the, from your publisher. And so, um, you know, everything's negotiable before you sign a contract and depending on how much the publisher wants to work with you, you know, may depend how much you can negotiate for, whether that's money, whether it's for production, uh, ownership stakes, things like that. Here's a, here's a big one to me that I've recently discovered because I'm in the process of just sitting down. I'm going to take a powder for a year and work on this thing without uh, having a book come out for a while. Uh, thankfully, we have this channel so that it's like we don't have to be like out of sight, out of mind. Long way of saying I'm looking at publishers to see like which place would be the best fit for this next comic that I'm going to do. And because of Hip Hop Family Tree, I have a whole infrastructure set up, man. I have agents on, on the hook, man. I have... Uh, lawyers on the I have I built a team mm -hmm. and one of my guys who does a lot of work with image pointed out that uh, there's no editor so uh, so who edits your book like is it just you rely on yourself your wife Brian Brian that's that's huge to me because I have a high school education we talked about my abuse of the comma on the last <laughs> kayfabe so I need that so Imagining that I'm going to now have to invest money in an editor, maybe you don't have the funds to do that or or the situation where you could pay for that or you have somebody to look at that. So maybe you want to go with, you know, Fantagraphics has editors. Top Shelf had editors. IDW has editors. Dark Horse has editors. So that's like, that's one big difference. And to me, that's a huge difference. because it Because it's about professionalism of the final product. And to have some uh, misspellings and, and, and weird syntax and stuff escape you and reach the printed page, it could take a reader out of the story and no good, man. Image does proofread. Does it? Yeah. Oh, that's, that's I'm not huge. getting any feedback on story and not, uh, you know, in the process. Like, I get a deadline, but I will get, uh, you know, this word's misspelled or this... Oh, that's you know, cool. Something, something's missing here or whatever. We'll put it back on the equal ground then. <laughs> I was really nervous but about... It's, it's, you know, it's a, it's a very big difference than what you think of as an editor. You know, it's, it's, it's a proofreader. It's, it's, not, it's not what we think of as an editor who's going through and saying, okay, story-wise, we don't see this character again, and so it's a question. Or, you know, yeah. editors, editors sort of see the whole picture and help shape and develop and do lots of stuff. Yeah, the backup brand, that is I call not them. There. If, you want, if you want that editor, you're, you're hiring one freelance at Image. Okay. There are publicity considerations. I think if if you're in the process of being of having a book that's attractive to a publisher, it's worth showing to all the publishers. See what you could get uh, from each of them. See where their expertise lies. Ask them. Don't be afraid to ask them about how they imagine publicizing the thing because that is a shortcoming of many of these publishers. They're so understaffed. It's really easy to kind of like imagine how understaffed they would be when you see the body of work that they put out in a year, you know, and the fact that one person is in charge of doing the publicity for that, um, very often, we'll say. And there's a lot of difference between comic book publishers and traditional publishers. You know, the comic book industry, I'm often very critical that it's not really an industry. Mm -hmm. You know, if you were to sort of define what makes an industry an industry, I'm not sure co American comics would qualify. So... I'm doing a book with Little Brown, mm -hmm. traditional book, big book publisher, what we would think of as a big book publisher. And like they just sent me a, a two page document of promotional plans for the next year for, for the Plain Janes. So it's a very different model than anything I've gotten from any publisher that I've worked with that is more of a traditional comic book publisher. With that said, comic book publishers are transitioning to book markets and you know following some of these examples and adopting some of these practices, whether it's hiring publicists in-house, you know, Image has added some publicists while I've been with them. Um, you know, and I think a lot of them you could point to different publishers are at different stages of this. So Drawn and Quarterly publisher is Peggy Burns now. Peggy Burns started as a publicist at DC in the 90s. That's one of those companies that is is further along in the idea of how do you publicize, how do you promote a book, how do you sell a book, yeah. how do you get it into these book channels and distro models and libraries and all of these things. Uh, you know, so that's something that, you know, publishers vary quite a bit. Again, these are things to have a checklist of what, what are you after? Uh, you know, what's most important to you? You probably can't get everything, but you can probably get a couple things. So figure out what's most important to you. If you hate uh, promotion, you may need a company that's good at that part. Yeah. That has experience with it. If you're bad at editing, you know, you may need a company that has a strong editorial component. 
Um, so, you know, these are things to kind of like have in mind whenever you're thinking about what is a good fit for me. Publishers were always uh, like very honest to me about where they see my books fitting into their scheme for the year. And those same publishers with other people I know who have books with these publishers, they were pretty honest with them too in saying things like, we would, this would be a, a C-level book for us to, to the homies, you know what I'm saying? And if they have that kind of honesty, like one that's super awesome, that, that's like you at least know where you are on the pecking order, but if you're a C-lister to them, maybe, maybe you want to see what the other guys have to say first, man, because getting your book orphaned is a true possibility, man. And, and, uh, if you can get any intel on like what's on the horizon, you could even take a look on their website and see what forthcoming books are, man. And if there's a couple of big name joints coming out, man, you could bet with these, the small coffers that these smaller publishers have, you could bet that a lot of that um, real estate is going to go to the bigger guy, man. So those are considerations too. But is this, uh, I'm not sure who, who's the guy who sent this? Adam? Adam. Adam, I don't know if we're putting the, the horse before the cart or vice versa, the cart before the horse. Just make the book, man. Uh, if you see this weekly, put something in the comments, like a link to your Instagram or, or your website or something like that. Let's take a look at your comic, man. And um, Because sometimes there is also a brand association with publishers too, man. And maybe just the aesthetic of the comic would lend well to a certain brand than others. I don't know if Image would have done better or worse for me if I would have went with Hip Hop Family Tree there. You see what I'm saying? Like, uh, the, the Wednesday Warrior crowd might not be as receptive to my, like, weird-ass art style as the book people. Like, so there are so many factors, like, almost too many to, to yeah, get into. Yeah, these are relationships, and, and it's complex, you know? Mm -hmm. I, I don't know what my contract is, 10, 10 or 12 pages, and it's just for book publishing rights, you know? So, like, there are a lot of, a lot of variables in this stuff. Identifying a publisher that fits the kind of book you're making is important. Um, you know, that, that was a huge thing, I think, whenever it was mostly comic book publishers. I can remember, you know, that would be the advice, one of the first paragraphs in the how to, how to do this or who to work with is like, why does your book fit here? Yeah. Uh, you know, so that's a consideration. Other rights to think about are digital rights, translation rights, media rights. Like, there's a lot of these things to consider, and every publisher handles them a little bit differently. So that's a thing to do homework on. And it may involve an agent. Um, you know, that, that's another component, somebody that can help you sort of find the right publisher. If you're new to the game, uh, you know, get the best deal that you can and, and, uh, and just do the work. Like, uh, put it out there, no, no problem. But if, if the book is attractive, like if you get a sense that they really like it, then another publisher might really like it. And the way you prosper in America is to get two people to uh, court you. It's true. It is true. It's, yeah. That's how it works, man. You get them to bid upwards, and then you get a better Two people deal that want one thing. Yeah. <laughs> Supply and demand. <laughs> it is, man. That's how it works. All right. One more email this week. This comes from Pablo Lacados, an Argentinian who is planning a big family trip and likes comic books. I just got invited to Argentina, man. Buenos Aires uh, in November sometime. I'm thinking of going. I didn't quite say yes. But if I do go, Pablo, man, come see me. Yeah, and for other Argentinian comic fans there, let us know how that show is, or how that event is, yeah, how the comic scene is in Argentina. Um, so he's going to be visiting Oslo, Norway, Stockholm, Sweden, Helsinki, Finland, St. Petersburg, Russia, Berlin, Germany, Washington, D.C., and New York. I can't speak to any of these cities with the exception of Washington, D.C. and New York. So if we have any, uh, any viewers who are familiar with comic shops, places to visit that are comics related in any of those cities, please share them in the comments. The one to go to in Oslo, I don't remember the name, but everybody <laughs> will know it uh, if you just mention the one that has Tintin on the hanging sign out front, man. It has a name that escapes me, but that's the one you want to go to. That's the big shop. Yeah, just ask for the shop that has the Tintin hanging out front, man. Also, I always hear Berlin has a really good magazine publishing scene. So, you know, you may want to do a little bit of research on, like, what is that city known for and take advantage of whatever their strengths are. But looking for a couple of shops in D.C. and New York area. D.C., I'm going to recommend Big Planet Comics. Uh, they are also a part-time publisher of Retrofit Comics. Um, Pablo also asks about, like, indie comics, fanzines, back issues. So I know they're open to indie comics, Big Planet Comics. Pretty good shop. In New York, um, Midtown and JHU are kind of big 
comic shops there, basically Wednesday type shops, a lot yeah. of a lot of the the stuff you would find from Diamond. But the two that I would recommend are Desert Island in Brooklyn, fantastic indie art comics. Uh, they'll have some foreign comics, mini comics, fanzines. That's a great shop to visit. Uh, and also Mysterious Time Machine, which I think used to be Roger's Time Machine. That's in Manhattan. You can Google the address for that. That's a store where you will wear. Last time I was there, I found a lot of fanzines and a lot of like older comics, things that you would dig for and not see in too many places. So if you're looking for, for indie stuff, stuff that's off the beaten path, that's the place to go. That's kind of a throwback. Man, there's fewer and fewer of these. You know, I, this made me think of, of St. Mark's. Uh, you know, Rest in peace. Pour, pour some out for them. Uh, these kind of old shops are harder and harder to find, I think, especially in the bigger cities. So there's a couple to look for. And, and please, K Fabers, you know, point out the shops that we're missing in D.C., Washington area, and any of the other cities we mentioned. We have some travels coming up ourselves uh, in the, the, the coming summer and beyond, man. Gearing up for June, uh, I have a couple of shows scheduled for June already. One is Heroes Con in Charlotte. Uh, we both do that show. We've been doing that show for probably a decade or, or more at this point. One of my favorite comic book sh shows uh, you know, if you're looking to meet us, if you want to get something signed, if you want to pick up, you know, whatever new thing we have, odds and ends, prints, art, all of that stuff, Heroes is a great show to do that. And uh, and really not just for us. Like, that's a great comic book show to, to visit if you're a comics fan. If you, lots of artists there to meet, lots of back issues to actually find comics. Um, it is a comic show in the old sense of the word. Uh, Southern hospitality. I always feel like I'm in a good mood there because everybody seems to be in a good mood there. I'm always so fearful of being looked at as an asshole because everybody <laughs> waits for the light to turn red before they cross the street, even if there are or are not cars coming. And it's like totally desolate and they're still waiting. And I'll just walk and I'm like, oh yeah, because I'm so comfortable <laughs> down there that I just feel like I'm in another yes. part of town. You know, and especially people are driving by, hey Ed, what's up? So you feel like you're at home. And then when I look back and I'm like, why is everybody just standing there? And I'm like, oh, yeah, we're, things just move at a slower clip. That's a great one. So we'll be there in mid-June. And then I just got accepted to uh, ALA mm -hmm. in Washington, D.C. I think it's the last weekend in June. Uh, I went to ALA two years ago in Chicago. So that's the big library conference. So any librarians that want to hang out, catch up. Um, also, if anybody has panels that they're hosting in these shows and they're interested in having us as guests on those panels, you know, please reach out to us to possibly arrange that. But uh, the ALA conference is a really fun one because it's, it's a totally different audience, but also book lovers, story lovers. It's that high level of enthusiasm of the people that are there, but the atmosphere is so different. So I, I enjoy seeing these uh, other audiences. Speaking of the, the panel thing, I think uh, Heroes Con asked us what kind of cartoonist kayfabe things we could do in terms of a panel or anything like that. We're kind of spinning wheels and scratching our head a little bit. So kayfabers who are going to be at Heroes Con, what kind of things would you like us uh, to uh, to do on a panel? Would, it, would You want like a magazine overview? Obviously there are technical limitations that we would have to figure out well in advance. Just another like kind of kayfabe weekly where we cut promos and talk about, uh, you know, do basically this except the Heroes Con version, where we talk about our 10 years of that. Um, there will definitely be a lot of uh, spicy talk, man, because I'm sure I'm going to cut promos on a couple jobbers that are below us uh, in, on that <laughs> convention floor. I'm going to have to do that. Also, uh, take a look at the Heroes Convention guest list, because that's always a tremendous guest list. And let us know if there's anybody you'd like us to get on stage and uh, ask some hard questions to. Shouts to Jim Mafood who who, said, who saw the last kayfabe, and he's like, guys, I'm, I'm going to do everything I can, man. I'm going to... I'm gonna hit Bill Sienkiewicz up on the jack, man, and, and try to try to like line you guys up, man. So that's the that's the big fish I'm going for, man. I'm trying to reel in so that we could put him in front of the camera, do a shoot interview, man, and ask the real questions, man. The questions that customers don't fucking ask. Yeah, he's he's definitely the guy I'd like to talk to. I think he's one of the most influential cartoonists to come through comics in the '80s, and uh, I have some questions about that. So hopefully we'll cross paths with them, and hopefully it'll be in a format that allows everybody to, uh, to, to, to watch that, to hear that. Do you have any other travels in stone before September? I don't think so. I think that's it so far. So in September, uh, Small Press Expo, Bethesda, Maryland, man. The big Marriott that's, that's there in the, in the city proper, I guess, man. Jim and I are going to be out there. Jim's going to have a table. Uh, I'm a guest of the show this year, and uh, the big thing that we're working toward, man, is to have copies of the studio edition there to sign like that's that's uh that's sort of the big goal man it's all contingent on 
those slow boats I mentioned earlier coming here. And I was a victim of government shutdowns with Hip Hop Family Tree number one when that came out for SPX, man. And we only had very few copies there. So we're bound by everybody else, but we're doing everything we can to make sure well, that we have those uh, things. Hopefully, Karma will be on your side this time. Hopefully, the boats arrive in time. It's fun to have a big book at a show like that yeah. because you can't hide it. You'll see people carrying it around all weekend. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, it's going to be fun, man. Um, and then there are just some some other weird travels that I have planned, like uh, like Japanese kayfabers. We sent some some merch to Japan. I'm going to Tokyo sometime in October. I haven't solidified that. Got invited to Argentina, like I said, Buenos Aires in November. I may or may not do that. And also, um, there's something going on in Colombia that I haven't like agreed to yet. So, like, I guess on an earlier show when I said, "Hey, hey, world, it's free," like they heard you. They heard me, man. Mother Earth is an answer. <laughs> Colombia. I don't know if it's their big show, but they have a big comic show there that I've been hearing good things about for a couple of years. So yeah. If that's the event, like I that think could it be is. a really nice event. I think it is. The, the Argentinian thing is a, more of a design conference, which interests me. My whole career is based on being like the only one in this space, you know, like being a needle in a needle stack. It's way harder to work out of, man, than just being like the comic guy at this thing, man. So if I'm the comic guy at that thing, I'm going. That's a good way to look at it. Some of my best experiences have been that where, where you know, it's not a comic book show. It's some, it's an art show. It's some other kind of event, but you're the comic book person there. Yeah. And it's changed my opinion of how comics are in the world. Yeah. Because when I was a kid, they were ostracized. But now whenever I'm the comics guy in the room, usually it's celebrated. People are interested and in, in have some point of reference. So, uh, those are fun. A design conference would be a good one. I'm a spoiled brat and I'm used to special treatment. <laughs> <laughs> I think that about wraps it up this week, Jim. Next show until coming out next week. If you kayfabers were hanging out on any of the spontaneous live streams, you saw that I was showing off some Akira animation cells that I have in my possession. And uh, we're doing a more proper show and tell uh, showing those off, man. And we actually, I actually took the time for once. I had these cells for about a decade and I finally took the time to like see the exact moment in the movie like where these cells show up, man. So there's a lot of good comparison, man, where I freeze frame the screen and like show you the exact thing, man. It's really pretty cool. That sounds good. That was a fun show to shoot. I like, I like animation. You know, we've talked about a lot of different topics that we may at some point bring into show and tell that are related to animation. So this cell is a good one. And uh, it's, it's fun to look at that stuff. I, I go through sometimes eBay dives looking at animation yeah. production artwork. So uh, I don't know if you can get any better than an Akira cell. And uh, Wizard uh, number 19 is going to be the Monday show. Going back to Wizard, man. So Jim and I are going to get back to it. We have a lot of video that we have to shoot today, man. You can pick up our merch. You can support us through our spread shop. There is a link below this video in the description. And uh, if you're new to the channel, like, subscribe, follow the channel. Uh, once you hit the subscribe button, hit the uh, little bell icon that's right next to the subscribe tab. It'll let you know whenever we have new videos available. We usually put up one or two a week at the, at the bare minimum. Uh, we're going back to business, man, but you guys know what your marching orders are. Read more comics.